message today can be good news or it can be bad news. It can be wonderful news for some of you or it can be horrible news for others. It can bring joy. It can also produce fear. It can generate hopeful expectation or dreadful anticipation. How you're going to respond as this message unfolds will largely depend on your personal relationship with God or the lack of it. Our message begins with this question. Are we living in the final days? Are we living in the final days? Our subject matter is about the end times. Wow. You love that, yes? Uh, you're like fortune tellers, you want to know the future, correct? <laughs> the end times. In theology, it's called eschatology. The study of things to come. It's a study of future events in history. Of the ultimate destiny of humanity. The Bible uses the term the last days when it refers to the end times. Look at the prophet Micah as he prophesied about this period. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established at the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his way so that we may walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the apostle Peter, quoting from the prophet Joel, said this in the book of Acts. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below. Blood and fire and bellows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And the apostle Paul describes the last days as terrible and horrible. 2 Timothy 3.1 but mark this, there will be terrible times in the what? The last days. And Peter said, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? Referring to the second coming of Christ. Where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. The last days is commonly known as the end of the world. That's how people describe it. The end of the world. So let me ask it this way. Do you think the end of the world is near? Do you think the end of the world is near? Or do you even believe that the world as we know it will end? You know, there are a lot of religions and many people who doesn't believe that the world as we know it will end. They see human history as a series of movements on the same circular pattern. It is not moving, history is not moving towards any conclusion, but rather it just keeps repeating itself. Over and over till forever. It's called cyclical history. That is the view of ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. And also the views of the Aztecs. And the Mayans. And the Buddhists and the Hindus. Cyclical history. Uh, this view of history no doubt influenced the teaching of reincarnation. You know, the cycle of death and rebirth, that they say the life, life on this world is bound. They believe that if you're really a bad person in this life, in your next life, you'll become a cockroach. <laughs> or 
a fly and you eat poop. So be good. And this is not a biblical teaching. Hebrews 9.27 says, Man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. Reincarnation, just like the doctrine of purgatory, have given people false hope that they can have a second chance to make right with God after they die. No, God's word says, that this life is the only life, only opportunity you have to make a decision to trust in Jesus Christ and get your life right with God. After you die, there is no second chance. Amen? The Christian's view of history is not cyclical. It's linear. Life on earth had a beginning and there will be an ending. Human history started in creation and it is moving towards conclusion in the book of revelation human life and the world as we know it will end not because of climate change or a nuclear war the world will end not in man's hand but in its creator History started with God and it will end with God. So the question is, when is it going to end? Are we living in the last days? In this study, I will give you, uh, this is a series actually, a short series. Now today, I'm going to give you an overview of future events in the last days. Okay? Now... God has laid out for us, to us, in Scripture. Because God does not want us to be ignorant of the future. Uh, did you know that the entire Bible, the, a third of the entire Bible is about the future? It's about prophecy. And what's, go ha what's going to happen, future from our perspective. And it is not guesswork. It is an accurate forecast of future history. And God wants us to be informed of the future for several reasons. One, while we are living in the present, God wants us to be informed of the future. Because having a right perspective of the future will help us live well in the present. Second, fulfilled prophecies proves the faithfulness and the power of God to keep his word and his promises. Therefore, building our faith today. Amen? And third, the study of future things gives us hope for the future. Knowing that no matter what we may go through in life, the trials and the tribulations that you and I go through, as everybody does, we know that in the end, we will win. There is redemption. But if you are not a Christian, then the study of future things is a warning for you. Because in the end, if you live your life with no regard for God, in the end, you will lose. There is damnation. That is why I said, this message could be good news or bad news, depending on your faith in God or the lack of it. Amen? So let me show you on the screen a biblical chronology of events in the last days. Well, for some of you, that prophetic timeline is familiar. And some of you can probably explain a couple of those events because I've spoken about this before. For others, this may be the first time you've seen that. And maybe by just looking at that, you're already confused. Don't worry, you'll get more confused as we go on with this study. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm reminded of that college student who had a big 
letter K printed on his t-shirt. And someone said, what does letter K mean? What does it stand for? And the student said, well, it stands for the word confused. And the guy said, what? You don't spell confused with a K. And the student said, that's how confused I am. Well, I'm going to explain and make a running commentary on these events to take some of the confusion that maybe you have. But first, I want to say this. The study of eschatology or the end times is quite difficult to grasp, especially if you have not been studying the Bible well enough. And, more especially if you are new to the Bible. So, if that's you, I want you to stick with me mentally. Because we're going to wade a little deeper into the vast ocean of theology. Are you with me? Now, at the end of this study, if you have questions about our discussion, I encourage you to write your questions in a piece of paper, or you can email me at sunnyville at yahoo.com. You can even talk about this during your small group discussion or gathering this week. And if you have questions, then you can, uh, seriously, you can ask me a question about this, and I'll try to answer it as best as I can and clarify any matter in regard to this study. Are you with me? Because I'm sure that for some of you, this is, this is not a very uh, familiar topic for you. Now, eschatology is the study of future things, but it does not begin in the future. It begins in the past. Because you cannot understand the future if you don't understand the past. So you need to start at the beginning. And the beginning is at creation in the book of Genesis, okay? Now, after man, you stay with me, are you, okay? After man was created by God, it didn't take long for man to rebel against his creator. God said, do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But he did. And the result was death, spiritual and physical death. Because God said, the day you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. Now, death in the Bible is not non-existent. If you die, it doesn't mean that you no longer exist. Death in the Bible means separation. Spiritual death means you are separated from God. If you are separated from God, you don't have any relationship with God. You are alienated from God. You are an enemy of God. And that is why everyone who is born into this world is an enemy of God. He or she is alienated from God. He doesn't have a relationship with God because he's been separate. he has been separated from God from birth because everyone is a sinner. Sin is what separates us from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were immediately separated from God. You remember? They were cast out of the Garden of Eden. So immediately, they died spiritually. Immediately separated from God. But physically, they died slowly just as us. It took 930 years for Adam to die. Physical death is separation of the human soul and spirit from the body. So spiritual death, separation from God. Human death or physical death is separation of the human soul and spirit from the body. And that was, and that is why all of us physically die. Because everyone born into this world is separated from God. That is part of the judgment of God against sin. Are you with me? Now, when man sinned, by God's grace and mercy, immediately he set in place or in motion his plan to save man. 
from the penalty of death. Immediately, when man sinned because God is gracious, he set in motion his plan to save man. God's plan was to save man because he knew that man would sin. So he already had a plan. Man cannot save himself. Man cannot conquer death, which is the penalty of sin. Only God can do that. And so the plan of God was to send his son, Jesus Christ, to the world to bring salvation to man. Jesus, in order to bring salvation to man, must become a man. Because as a man, he can stand in our behalf before God. But he is also God. He is both man and God. Being God, he can conquer death. Are you following? If he was just a man just like us, then he would not have the power to conquer death. He did that in the resurrection. And by the way, we're going to celebrate the resurrection next Sunday, isn't it? He conquered death in the resurrection because he is God. If he was man, then he has no power over death. He has to be man in order to stand in our behalf as man, and but he has to be God in order to conquer death. And because he is God, he can give eternal life. And that is why Jesus is the only Savior of man. Are you with me? Salvation and eternal life is found only in Christ. Are you still there? So, when man sinned, God in his mercy set the motion to save man. And his plan was to send Jesus into the world. Now Jesus, when he came into this world, came as a Jew. Amen? God chose Israel out of the nations of the world. Out of the nations of the world, he chose Israel, not because they were good, not because they were many, simply because of his sovereign will. He chose Israel so that from Israel, the salvation of man may come to the rest of the world. To them was given the good news that salvation through Christ has come. And they were supposed to spread the good news to the rest of the world. But you know what happened. They didn't receive Christ as the Messiah and God. They rejected Christ. Amen? Salvation, that's why Jesus said salvation comes from the Jew. Why? Because Jesus was a Jew. That's what he said to the Samaritan. And the Jew was supposed to share the good news to others. That was their privilege. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. First for the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Amen? Israel was very, very privileged, but they rejected and crucified their Messiah. As a result, God rejected Israel. But not forever. Look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. Remember that Paul was a Jew as well. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people. That was the Jews. Those of my own race. The people of Israel, theirs is adoption to sonship. Because they were the chosen people of God, remember? Theirs the divine glory. The covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant that God made with the patriarchs. The receiving of the law, the Ten Commandments and other laws given by God through Moses. 
the temple worship and the promises given by God to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through David. They were the patriarchs of Israel. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is God over all forever praised. So the Israelites were in a very privileged position indeed. But in spite of that, they rejected their Messiah. Even today, most Jews still don't believe that Jesus is God and the Messiah because they said that Jesus didn't fulfill the prophecies of the Messiah in the Bible. I wouldn't go to the details. But they said that Jesus didn't fulfill the prophecies of God, of the Messiah in the Bible. And Jesus didn't fulfill the embodiment of the personality of the Messiah. So since there is no one who have qualified or met the requirements of the Messiah, until today the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah. Because of the rejection... God rejected them. God judged them by hardening their hearts. Verse 25, chapter 11 of Romans. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a what? A hardening of? In part, the hardening, this is related to, or this is referring to the hardening of the heart. The hardening of the heart so that they can see and understand the truth of Jesus Christ even today. When a man hardens his heart and rejects the truth of God, God in judgment oftentimes hardens that person's heart even more. So that he will suffer the consequences of rejecting the truth. This is what happened to Pharaoh of Egypt, remember? Over and over, God sent Moses to Pharaoh, let my people go, the Israelites, so that they can worship me freely. But he hardened his heart. He rejected the truth. He didn't let him go. And he suffered the consequences of rejecting the truth. It took 10 plagues that destroyed, killed his own son. His family suffered. The whole of Egypt suffered because he rejected the truth. Ironically, the Israelites did exactly what Pharaoh did. They hardened their heart, rejected the Messiah. God in judgment hardened their hearts even more. And they suffered for it. You know, Israel today is part of the land of Canaan. Remember Canaan? Canaan was the land promised by God to Abraham and to his descendants, the Israelites, to possess. If the Israelites at that time when Christ came embraced Christ as their Messiah, they would have lived in that land in peace and prosperity. Instead, because they rejected Jesus, they were dispersed all over the world, hated, persecuted, killed by the millions by people like Hitler. Even today, while most Jews are back in the land of Israel and they have been restored as a nation on May 14, 1948, which by the way was prophesied in the Bible, even today, Israel is still surrounded by hostile forces of Muslim countries that are bent on their destruction. Until the nation of Israel will turn to God, they will never be able to live in peace. Their problems with the Palestinians, that can never be resolved. It will be resolved when Jesus returns. And that's in the millennium. Are you following me? And so, because Israel rejected Jesus, God rejected them. God hardened their hearts, but it's just in part, as Paul said. Meaning the judgment of God against Israel is temporary. They will be restored back to God, as I said, in the millennium. Now, I'll explain about that. It's not the name of a beer, okay? <laughs> it's not Miller's not, or whatever. <laughs> millennium. 
until the number of the Gentiles. Watch it. Hardening of the heart in part until the full number of the Gentiles. Gentiles, of course, referring to us. The non-Jews, the other peoples of the world, has come, come in, has come in. Come into what? To the kingdom of God, to be saved. And then, God would deal with Israel again. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. That's very interesting as it is there. Until the full number of the Gentiles. Did you know what that means? It implies that there is a quota. A number of people who are not Jews that will be saved. That actually hastens the coming of Christ. Are you with me? That is why if you're evangelizing, if we are, and bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture will come faster. <laughs> Did you see that? Hello? Until the full number of the Gentiles. That's very interesting. We'll talk about more of that later. So what, is, what does this all mean? Okay? Are you still with me? What does this all mean? Since the time of the rejection of the Jews, Israel, God's program for Israel has been set aside. As a nation, they have no part in God's plan to bring salvation to the world. Why? Because they don't believe that Jesus is the Savior. Make sense? So if not them, who are God's servants to bring the gospel of salvation to the rest of the world then? If not them, who? The church, us. Amen? Are you with me? They were supposed, the Jews were supposed to spread the gospel. But they rejected Christ because of their unbelief. The task has fallen on us today. That's why the task of the Great Commission was given to us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you even to the very end of the age. Jesus used to say, when he came, he said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Did you read that? And then he told his disciples, don't go to the towns of the Gentiles or the Samaritans. Only go to the lost ship of Israel because that was God's original plan. And when you go, he said, tell them the good news that the kingdom of God is at hand or near. Why? Because the king, Jesus, was there. If they embrace Christ... Jesus would have established his kingdom here on earth. But because they rejected Christ, they've been rejected as well. And they have no part as a nation in God's plan of salvation. So in other words, you, my brethren, are the chosen to bring the gospel of God to the rest of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. In other words, if we are not doing it, no one else is doing it. That is a great privilege, just like he gave to the Jews. I hope to God that we will not make the same mistake the Jews did and disobey. Amen. That we will faithfully fulfill this great command. Amen? So, let's bring back the timeline on the screen once again. This time, I'm sure it will make more sense to you. Okay? It's hidden a little bit. That's creation. That's the recreation or the new heavens and the new earth. History is linear. It began in creation. And it's moving surely but slowly but surely to a conclusion. To the new heavens and the new earth. Creation is now marred, broken, and corrupted by the sin of man. 
That's why Paul says that whole creation is groaning. The world is being destroyed because of man's sin, not because of climate change. Amen? A time will come that the present creation, this is the end of the world, literally the end of the world. That part there. Where God would destroy this world as we know it and recreate, make the new heavens and a new earth. So, when man sinned against God, he set in motion his plan to save man. Amen? When God made the pronouncement of judgment against the serpent in the Garden of Eden, the serpent was the embodiment of Satan. When God made a judgment on the serpent, he said that the seed of the woman, Genesis chapter 3. Now you look at some of you and say, what are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The study of his catology would be hard for you to grasp if you're not studying your Bible well. Okay? But this is something that you really need to know. Okay? So, in Genesis chapter 3, God said to the serpent, who is the embodiment of Satan, the seed of the woman, meaning referring to Jesus, would bruise your head. That means Jesus will destroy you. But you, Satan, will, dis will bruise the heel of Jesus, referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. The wound on the head is fatal. The one on the heel is not. In other words, Satan will never destroy Jesus. But sa Satan will be destroyed by Jesus. And it happened in the crucifixion. Amen? And so that part, that passage there in Genesis chapter 3, is actually the first prophecy. That Jesus, the Savior of the world, will come. And that's in Genesis chapter 3. Remember? So since Old Testament times, from that time to the Old Testament times, God raised prophets proclaiming the same message, the Savior of the world shall come. And finally, Jesus came. That's the first coming of Christ. Born in Bethlehem. He lived as, Jew, as a Jew for 33 years. And then, he died. He was crucified. He died for the sins of the world. Rejected by his own people. First John chapter 1 verse John chapter 1 verse 12. He came into this world, yet his own did not accept him. Amen. His own people, the Jews, rejected him. That's why Jesus said, "The prophet has no honor in his own town." His own people rejected him and crucified him. And that's the cross. But three days later, Jesus resurrected. Forty days after, he ascended to heaven, back to heaven. Ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish festival, the Holy Spirit, as promised by Jesus Christ, when I go, remember when he said to his disciples, when I go, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will send you another counselor and he will be with you and live in you. That's the Holy Spirit. That was given during Pentecost. That was the day of the birth of the church, the universal body of Christ. That is why since Pentecost until today, it's called the church age. We are still, where are we now? We are still on the church age. It's a long period in history. But the next world shattering event and will terminate the church age is called the rapture. The rapture of the church. Why does it terminate the church age? Because the rapture will translate, will carry and cut and cu catch up the Christians, the genuine born again Christians. 
They will be caught up in the clouds. Jesus will meet them in the clouds and he will bring them to heaven to be with him forever. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why the church age terminates with the rapture. Paul would say in the twinkling, in the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, a fraction of an atom, all born again Christians will disappear. I'd love to talk about that more in our, in our study. So that if a born again Christian pilot is driving or is piloting an airplane, boom, he disappears, the plane will crash. If you're a born-again Christian and the rapture happens and you're driving the car, boom, it will crash. And all the unbelievers, your passengers, dies as well. <laughs> Sounds funny, but that is what's going to happen. All of a sudden, if your wife is a Christian and you're not, your wife will just disappear. You'll be looking for where is she? And all is left is her wedding ring and her clothes. You're left, left behind. Amen. That's the rapture. And why does God take the Christians out of this world at that time? Because God will judge the world after that. It's called the great tribulation. After God brings all the born again Christians out of this world, God will judge the world. Read Revelation 4 to 19 and you will see the pain and the suffering. The great pain and suffering that the people of this world will experience. And Daniel chapter 9 says it's seven years. Seven years of great pain and suffering and destruction. One year is bad enough, but seven years? That's why Jesus said, if this period has not been cut short, no one will survive. The great tribulation is God's judgment on the unbelieving world. Those who reject Christ as their Lord and Savior. In your rapture, you can look it up at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's why the message about the future is good news and bad news, isn't it? The good news is you'll be in heaven. The bad news is you'll be left behind and go through the pain of seven years. That's not my word. It's what God's word says, the Bible. I'm not telling this to scare you. I'm telling you this to inform you so that you will check, as Paul says, test whether you are in the faith. Check if you are a real Christian. It will be tragic thinking that you're a Christian because you come to church and then when the rapture comes, you are left behind. I can assure you if the rapture happens in our, day, in our time, I'll be one of those who will be caught up in the clouds and be with my Lord forever. Not because I'm better than everyone else, but it's because I have given my life to the Lord and made him my Lord and Savior. If there are some of you who will be left behind during the rapture, you can be the pastor of Riso Church. <laughs> I'll give you my laptop as well, okay? <laughs> Okay, you can take turns. <laughs> I'm reminded of that man who had a major surgical operation. He woke up at the recovery room, still dazed by the anesthesia. And the first face that he saw was the beautiful face of the nurse. And he said, am I in heaven? Are you an angel? And then at the corner of his eye, he saw his wife standing in the room. And he said, no, this can't be heaven. <laughs> My wife is here. <laughs> A Christian had this bumper sticker on his car that reads, In case of rapture, this car will be unoccupied. In case of rapture, someone please take the wheel. In case of rapture, give my car to my brother-in-law. 
We can have a little laugh about this, but in truth, this is a serious matter. Every time I think about this, I feel sadness in my heart, thinking about those who are not saved. Some of them are my relatives. Because we are not making up stories here. This is the word of God. And if what God says here in the Bible, this will happen. Jesus said, heaven and earth will not pass away until every word will pass. Amen? That's why it is a very serious matter. I think about this and I think about my loved ones, my friends, and everyone else who are not saved. And when the rapture comes, they will go through the pain and suffering of the seven-year tribulation period. Now, close to the tribulation period is called the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, they make movies, movies about out, out of this, but that is not a biblical uh, uh, version. Armageddon. Just like they made a movie of Noah starring Russell Crowe. That was not biblical either. The Battle of Armageddon. This is the final war between the governments of the world and God. Even today, the governments of the world are against God. They've passed legislations against God's idea of marriage. One of that is our government. They remove God's gender distinctions between man and woman. They remove the name of God in their national anthem. Like the Swiss government. And there's a similar move in Canada as well. They ban the Lord's Prayer in public schools and in public meetings and in government functions. Here in Victoria, the Labour Party and the Greens Party. They are pushing to disallow, to ban the praying of the Lord's Prayer when they start their session in Parliament. We live in a world and societies that are increasingly hostile to the God of the Bible and Christianity. They are removing slowly but surely all traces and symbols of the God of the Bible. And this hostility against God will come to a head in the battle of Armageddon. The governments of the world will bring their armies and they will fight against the people of God, Israel, and against God. They will be headed by the great Antichrist and Satan will be the power behind them. But when they are gathered in the in Megiddo, that's what it means. Armageddon is a place. Armageddon. When they're gathered there, Jesus will return. The second time. And he will destroy all the armies of the world and everyone in the world for their wickedness and rebellion. He will come with his angels. And together with all the saints who were part of the rapture. If you're part of the rapture, you'll be there. Amen? And then Jesus will usher in the millennium. The millennium is the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. That's what he promised to the Jews. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. His reign on earth. So at this time, during the tribulation, the nation of Israel will turn back to God. And they are the ones, some, many of them will populate the kingdom of God on earth for a thousand years. During the millennium, Satan will be bound. He will be bound. So there is no Satan and demons to tempt people in the world. Imagine that. No Satan. No temptations. Jesus is reigning literally. And his throne will be in Jerusalem. 
He will have his throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's why he's called as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because Christians are also called as kings together with Christ. We will reign together with Christ. Remember? But Jesus is King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is reigning. No Satan. And you would think the people living in that blessed time would live for God. But that is not so. There will still be people who will rebel against God. It only goes to show how sinful human heart is. That's what happened to the Jews, remember? When they were marching out, God was with them every step of the way. He showed his power, his miracles, and he provided for them. He showed his love, and yet they rebelled against him. Remember that? That's how sinful the heart is. After the 1,000 year reign, Satan will be released one more time. It's called the last rebellion of Satan. The purpose of which is to test the heart once again for the last time. The people of the world. Whether they would glorify and honor God after they experience the 1,000 year reign of Christ. But in that test, people will fail. And Satan's rebellion will fail. Finally, God will judge Satan, his demons, and all those who rebel against God in the great white throne judgment. If a person faces the great white throne judgment, it is not whether he's going to be judged to go to heaven or to hell. No, he's already condemned. It's only a matter of what degree his punishment would be. And after that, Jesus, God himself now would purge his creation of sin that was corrupted by man. And he will recreate the heavens and the earth. And everything will go back as it was in the creation. A perfect world of love, joy, and peace. Amen? Wonderful, isn't it? If you're a Christian, knowing how the future ends will give you something wonderful and great to look forward to, isn't it? It gives you faith today and hope for the future. But if you are not a Christian, you should be afraid of the future because there is condemnation and damnation. But you can change your destiny by repenting of your sins. And trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. At the end of this message, I am going to give you that opportunity. <coughs> Take that opportunity to give your life to the Lord before it's too late. As we ask the question, are we living in the last days? And the answer is yes, we are. Jesus said in Revelation 21 verse 7, I will come soon. He said those words more than 2,000 years ago. I will come soon. He will come for his church, us, and he will bring us to heaven. But he will also come after seven years to judge the world. Now imagine if he spoke that more than 2,000 years ago. Imagine how closer that is now. Amen? That is why come to Jesus before it's too late. Now for us Christians, I'd like to say this. Knowing the future should encourage you to live for God today because you know that each of us will come face to face with God in heaven and he will hold us accountable for how we live our lives here on earth. Amen? And second, it should encourage us more to tell others about Jesus so that they too may be saved. Don't go to heaven on your own, by yourself. Bring others. Amen? Tell them about the salvation that comes through Christ. You must take these words that you have heard today seriously because God is very serious about people's souls. Jesus died for them, remember? 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. As we're bowed, as we are bowing our heads, all bows are, all heads are bowed, and all eyes closed. As I said, I'm going to give you those of you who have not yet turned your life to Christ. If you are not sure you're a Christian, you may think you are. Coming to church does not make you a Christian.